Tonight, Ottawa's former police chief under fire and under pressure again. You were pretty concerned that you would lose your job and be blamed for what had happened. Absolutely not, sir. Peter slowly pushes back and tries to defend his reputation and his actions during the convoy protests. A night out fishing turns into a rescue on the water. You gotta get out of the car, you gotta man. get out. The man who jumped in to save a stranger. You never know what might make you a hero. And she's risked her life to report the truth in the Philippines. Now Maria Ressa could spend the rest of it in prison. Is there not a part of you that says, I have to save my life, but who would I be? Why the Nobel Peace Prize winner refuses to run. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. One after the next, former Ottawa police chief Peter Slowly is trying to fend off attacks to his reputation over how he handled the convoy protests that rolled into a city last winter. This was day two of his testimony at the Emergencies Act inquiry, and at times it got heated as he sought to defend the decisions he made and didn't make in those tense days. As Rafi Bujikanian shows us, that put Slowly in the hot seat again, where the language got a little graphic. The convoy protest outlasted former Ottawa Police Chief Peter Slowly's career, if only by days. He resigned just before police cleared it out with help from the Emergencies Act. At the inquiry into its use, Slowly is now fighting to save his reputation. You were pretty concerned that you would lose your job and be blamed for what had happened. Absolutely not, sir. In heated testimony, as he was grilled by the lawyer for his former police service, he pushed back against accusations he ignored emails about the dangers the protest posed. I'm going to suggest um, to you, Mr. Slowly, that once you receive that email, um, this one here, um, you at some point decided that you could blame Deputy Chief Bell at the time for not planning for this event. That is absolutely incorrect, sir, and I really take offense to that notion. Thank you. He also had to answer to accusations of micromanaging and angry outbursts during the occupation, including one against an Ontario provincial police officer. And you don't recall saying that you'll cut off Dave Springer's nuts and use them as bookends. And use them as bookends? No, sir. I don't recall saying that. I don't think I've ever said anything like that. At the time, the Ottawa Police Service was paying crisis management company Navigator for a communications strategy. The bill, more than $185,000. Slowly also faced questions from the lawyer for the federal government, who again zeroed in on the issue of tow trucks, arguing that the Emergencies Act was necessary to compel tow truck drivers to help move big rigs slowly painted a desperate picture. At one point there was an attempt to get the Ministry of Transport to assist with the tow truck issue. Do you recall that? At one point, I, th I think even Commissioner Lucky, I don't think she was flipping about it, but they were looking at Kijiji to find heavy tow trucks in Canada. So Rafi, that's it for slowly on the stand. Tomorrow though, I gather we're going to hear from some of the protesters. What's your sense of what we can expect? Some of the protest organizers will be up first, Adrian, and among them are people who are facing criminal charges, including mischief and obstruction. Now, Tuesday, we're also keeping an eye out for the Ontario government's appearance in court as it tries to say Premier Doug Ford and Deputy Premier Sylvia Jones have parliamentary privilege and should not have to testify before the commission. The commission says that's overstated. All right, lots to watch for. Rafi Bujikani in Ottawa. Thanks, Rafi. More denials now from the head of the RCMP and a high-profile cabinet minister. They say they never tried to interfere in a police investigation into Nova Scotia's mass shooting of 2020. Marina von Stackelberg shows us how they did today under questioning from opposition MPs. Canada's former Minister of Public Safety Bill Blair and RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky. Again, grilled over allegations they interfered with the police investigation into Canada's deadliest mass shooting in 2020 in Nova Scotia. The Conservatives are demanding they both resign. No one would consider resigning for only telling the truth. There's never been any direction from any government officials. 
Opposition parties allege Blair's office asked Lucky to make the Nova Scotia RCMP publicly release details about their investigation, specifically what types of weapons the gunmen used, so that information could be used to prop up the Liberal government's pending gun legislation. You've directly refuted this in committee, so how do you explain that? So I explain it with fact, just the truth. The reality is, in, in all my conversations with the commissioner, at no time did I direct her, ask her, or even suggest that she release that information. Lucky also says Blair never demanded RCMP release the details about the guns. Instead, his office had simply asked if the Mounties planned to release it. To us, that's political pressure from the minister's office. That's well, I, the concern I, here, ma'am. I appreciate your and perception, but your perception is incorrect. Earlier this month, the ongoing inquiry into the shooting released a recording of a phone call between Lucky and the Nova Scotia Mounties from 10 days after the shooting. Does anybody realize what's going on in the world of handguns and guns right now? The fact that they're in the middle of trying to get a legislation going, the fact that that legislation is supposed to actually help police. Lucky told the committee it was her job to keep the government up to date on the investigation. The phone call was because the Nova Scotia Mounties had left her out of the loop. Her mention of the gun control legislation, she says, was just context. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. A shooting outside a high school in Toronto has left one teenager dead and another in hospital tonight. At this time, I can't confirm if either of those two males were students at the school that is currently under investigation. Police say the teen who died was found shot in front of the school. He was taken to hospital where he died. The other teenager walked into a hospital. He also had gunshot wounds. This all happened just before 3.30 this afternoon. Two schools were briefly put into lockdown. Police say the shooter was seen fleeing the area. We have some disturbing new details tonight about what the Canadian-born man accused of attacking U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband allegedly told police he wanted to do that night. 42-year-old David DePap is now facing several charges, including assault and attempted kidnapping, for allegedly attacking Pelosi's husband with a hammer after breaking into their home on Friday. Now, authorities say DePap told police he planned to hold Nancy Pelosi hostage, and if she, quote, lied he would break her kneecaps. Pelosi was not home at the time. Her husband is expected to make a full recovery, and if convicted, DePap faces up to 50 years in prison. The search is still underway for missing people in India after yesterday's devastating bridge collapse. More than 130 people are now confirmed dead. Salima Shibji shows us the aftermath and what's known about the people arrested today. A night of celebration during India's most festive season quickly turned terrifying. New video of the moment that sent so many on the crowded bridge plunging into the river below, chilling to see. As was the frantic search to rescue survivors deep into the night and the following day. The effort is on to trace the missing persons. But that hope turned to anguish for many now grieving lost relatives. He didn't even tell me he was going there. This woman mourning her husband cries repeatedly. Those who survived are left with painful memories. Death was in front of us. We thought we'd be pulled into the river, Ashwin Mera says, but we clung to what was left of the bridge. I couldn't really see the water, this man says, only people falling off the bridge around me. His friend didn't make it. Even with the efforts of locals who spent hours at the river's bank trying to rescue as many as they could. I have seen so many small children who lost their lives. J.D. Barra is haunted by what he saw. It's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. Can't imagine. Still that, that faces of the children are in my mind. The bridge is 140 years old, but recently repaired, reopened just days before the collapse. The main question now is how? How is it allowed to reopen without, as a local city official claimed, the proper clearance? Indian police quickly arrested nine people, including two managers of the company that renovated and operated the bridge, and filed culpable homicide charges against the company. 
Local police say more arrests are likely as the town tries to come to grips with the loss of so many so abruptly. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Vancouver. And South Korean investigators are pouring over CCTV and social media video looking for what triggered a deadly crowd surge during a Halloween party in Seoul. At least 154 people died, most of them in their 20s and 30s. Those are crime scene investigators and forensic teams in the alley today where that crush happened. It's still unclear what caused people to cram into the already packed space Saturday night. The president has called for a thorough investigation, and he and many others made their respects at memorial altars in the city. A week of mourning has been declared. Authorities in Iran are stepping up a crackdown on protesters. They've announced public trials for a thousand people accused of acts of sabotage. <laughs> the trials are reportedly set to take place in Tehran this week, what is now the seventh week of unrest, sparked by the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini in police custody. So far, one human rights group estimates at least 270 people have been killed in the crackdown. And with no end in sight to the violence, Canada is now ramping up pressure on the regime. The government announced new sanctions targeting Iran's national police force. In a statement, Canada's foreign affairs minister accused the force of, quote, lethal suppression and arbitrary arrest of unarmed Iranian protesters. Thousands of people in Ukraine's capital are without water or electricity after a wave of Russian missile strikes targeting critical infrastructure. Multiple cities across the country were hit. David Common shows us the consequences. Nearly daily, for three weeks, Ukrainian civilians have heard this. <laughs> Russian cruise missiles finding their target. Unable to succeed on the front lines, Russia is again focusing its fury on cities and infrastructure knocking out water to 80% of the capital at one point, leaving hundreds to line up with jugs and clearing out store shelves. Airstrikes are also repeatedly striking Ukraine's electrical systems, the source of heating as winter approaches. They want to freezing the whole population in our hometown. It's, it's genocide, it's no in other words. This is a Russian missile, just as a smaller Ukrainian rocket takes it out. Ukraine says it did that at least 44 times today, but some got through. Russia calls it all retaliation for this, what appears to be a new Ukrainian tactic, using uncrewed, small, explosive boats to target Russia's navy. Here, a Russian helicopter and then warship are seen firing at the drone, but two Russian ships were hit. As a result, Vladimir Putin says Russia is suspending a UN-brokered pact, which allows Ukraine to ship grain abroad. What happens next on the seas is uncertain. On the ground, as the cold deepens, there are worries about what winter will bring. I was born here, says Raisa. Where am I supposed to go? Civilians have long faced the collateral damage in this conflict. Increasingly now, they are the target. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. In this country, the Premier of Saskatchewan says he's sorry a convicted killer attended last week's throne speech. And I've offered a, an unequivocal apology to the people of Saskatchewan for, um, quite frankly, not providing better leadership last week. Colin Thatcher, a former Saskatchewan cabinet minister who murdered his ex-wife in 1983, was invited to last week's ceremony by a member of Moe's caucus. At the time, the premier brushed off calls for an apology. Well, today, he called the decision to invite Thatcher a terrible error in judgment. And the MLA who did so has been stripped of his legislative secretary duties. This is a very hard night for one Quebec family with a tragic end to a wrenching police search. The body of a one-month-old boy was found this morning in a river, according to Laval police. The baby was traveling with his mother and sister on Friday when their vehicle plunged into the water. The discovery ends a days-long search along that river. And there was a very different ending to another emergency on the water, this time in Ontario, where two men out fishing spotted someone in trouble. 
as Meg Roberts shows us, what happened next was caught on video and a warning you may find some of it distressing. Come on, someone come here quick, man. Sean McNeil says he was at the right place at the right time. Buddy, are you okay? Thursday night at the harbor in Hamilton, Ontario, he was there fishing with a friend when they saw a car enter the water with someone inside. It's going up. We realized, oh, hey, the guy's still in there. Uh, so we're yelling at him, hey, man, like, get out, get out. You got to get out of the car, You got to get out. McNeil's friend captured the entire incident on video. When they noticed the bubbles stop coming from the car, he grabbed a pair of scissors. Oh, this is about to be cold. And jumped in to try and get the man out. Uh, they pulled him out, he was completely limp, so I was like, okay, uh, might be a little bit too late here. So with Sam's on shore and he's yelling, do CPR, so I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. Breathe, <laughs> breathe, breathe! The only thing McNeil says, he hasn't had formal CPR training. I just kind of remember what I've seen in movies, right? You know, chest compressions, you know, blowing the out. Come on! Come on, wake up! After three rounds of CPR, the 78-year-old man started breathing again. With the help from police in a nearby fishing boat, they were pulled to safety. Uh, everyone kept telling me to get into the truck, but I was running around in my Crocs there, <laughs> uh, just trying to, I don't know, calm down. But I kept shaking, and everyone's like, very cold. I'm like, I'm not cold. I'm just kind of, uh, you know? Ready? Hamilton Ready? police are calling McNeil brave for jumping in and saving a stranger. Investigators say the driver was taken to hospital in non-life-threatening condition and that it's not clear how the car ended up in the water. The investigation continues. If you can do something, like save a life, do it. No matter how small or big it might be, whether it be jumping into freezing cold water or even just talking to somebody, um, you never know what might make you a hero, too. Sean, hop on the boat, too, man. Meg Roberts, CBC News, Toronto. Starting tomorrow, Netflix subscribers are about to get a lower-cost alternative, but in return, they'll get something they've never seen before in the platform. They're kind of obnoxious. I just don't like them. I just can't stand commercials. Why Netflix is launching ads and what it could mean for the future of streaming. Next. A Nobel Peace Prize-winning journalist putting everything on the line for what she believes in. It's almost 100 years. It's the rest of my life. 100 years. Coming up, Maria Ressa tells me why she won't flee, even if it means a possible life sentence. Plus, five years after Me Too changed the world. Several women have come forward accusing Harvey Weinstein of sexual harassment. Where the movement stands now and where it could go next. We're back in two days. The National, voted Canada's best national newscast. If by chance you were trying to scroll through your feed on Instagram today, you might have come across a message like this one. For about eight hours, thousands of users worldwide were locked out. Many told they'd been suspended for not following community guidelines. The head of Instagram had to take to another social media platform to say they're working on the problem. The company later blamed it on a software bug. Elon Musk is already making some big changes at Twitter. Tonight, there's word he's fired the entire board of directors, temporarily, he says. But as Thomas Degler reports, that's feeding into concerns about the future of the platform itself. She's tweeted for years, but now, like millions of others, Jillian Sunderland suddenly faces a dilemma. Wait to see Elon Musk's version of Twitter or quit right now. I'm really worried about getting a barrage of harassment. Um, he goes on kind of the U.S. definition of free speech with, in Canada. A lot of free speech there would be labeled hate speech here. A new U.S. securities filing makes it clear. Musk has become the sole director of Twitter, putting a self-described free speech absolutist in total control. Will we see more threats? It's a frightening prospect for users like Dr. Nahid Dasani, who tweeted crucial information during the pandemic and received vile tweets in return. I do worry that health workers in this country who are really just trying to serve the communities they care for, put out science, information and evidence, will become bigger targets. He's got a blue check mark next to his name that's designed to prevent prominent users like celebrities, politicians and journalists from being 
impersonated. Now, Musk says he's going to revamp the verification process, and that could mean a monthly fee for that blue check mark. And consider Musk's tweet briefly spreading a conspiracy theory about the attack on Nancy Pelosi's husband. The police response? It really is, is sad that these theories are being floated out there and they're damaging. Emma Bell works to advance health care for non-binary and trans people and wonders if Twitter is still a right fit. So it's really hard to decide what action that we need to take now um, in order to preserve our own sanity. Back at her apartment, Jillian Sunderland signed up for a newer platform, Mastodon. I'm trying to look for a Twitter alternative, but it's been quite hard and difficult and kind of scary also. Some users will find it hard to leave Twitter, just as Musk faces challenges to lead it. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Now to a big change at Netflix that kicks in tomorrow, a less expensive membership option. But as Philippe de Montigny explains, of course, there's a catch. It's something never seen before on Netflix. Lady! Four to five minutes of ads per hour on the streaming service. That's if you sign up for its new cheaper membership for $5.99 a month, an option for anyone looking to save money right now. And according to a new survey, a lot of Canadians are. One in three have cancelled at least one streaming subscription in the last six months. But some Netflix users say they are willing to pay more to avoid those ads. The consumerism, the marketing, um, they're loud, they're kind of obnoxious. I just, I, I don't like them. I just can't stand commercials. Experts say Netflix is trying to seduce price-conscious consumers ahead of plans to crack down on password sharing next year. It's a mitigation strategy to get people, as they're changing the digital backend, to make sure people can't share their account with seven people, okay? To not lose the people who are like, okay, well, now I can't share my dad or my friend or my sister's account. Netflix says the new lower cost plan won't include its entire library and subscribers won't have the option to download titles for remote viewing. It's good. Still in New York, marketing agencies are excited at the prospect of buying ad space on Netflix. We've known it's been coming since the inception of Netflix. It's an economic reality that at some point they were going to run out of people willing to pay for it and they're going to have to find new ways to grow. Netflix isn't the only streaming service testing the waters in the U.S. HBO Max and Paramount Plus are among those already offering cheaper ad-supported memberships, a trend we're likely to see more of here in Canada. Philippe de Montigny, CBC News, Toronto. A shortage of workers stalks almost every industry, but it is hitting trucking especially hard. This is your house. This is your trucking firm. How bad did it get? For you. It was a matter of if we don't start to look at this in a different way, our industry, our business, the sustainability of the whole supply chain for our country was at stake. We needed to so how does it get resolved? Tomorrow night we'll bring some of Canada's big bosses together to talk about the solutions they're finding to recruit and keep workers and crucially keep them happy. So you can watch for that tomorrow and up next tonight. Even as she stares down the prospect of life in prison, Journalist Maria Ressa remains focused on the fight she says we are all facing. I think there's far more at stake in the world than my freedom or my fate. Coming up next, my conversation with the Nobel Prize winner. Plus, five years after hashtag Me Too, where the movement stands today. What if you faced life in jail on largely politically motivated charges, but you could flee the country and save yourself, would you? That's what some urge Nobel Peace Prize winner Maria Ressa to do. She is the famed Filipino journalist who's long gotten under the skin of dictators, but she won't flee. Earlier this month, on what might have been her last trip to Canada before facing the Supreme Court, she stopped by the CBC. It was also just before a Filipino court ordered her to not comment publicly on her case. We talked about her work safeguarding democracy and her big decision. The bully expects that you will go down alone. But that's the reason why you don't go down voluntarily. I hope, I expect 
people will come in to help and that will help transform and strengthen our democracy. In the Philippines, this is where I live. Don't say I'm naive. <laughs> no, you're not naive. Welcome. Good. Good. Welcome. Like, Nobel Peace Prize it. winner Maria Ressa really isn't naive, but she is in trouble. More lows than highs or more highs than lows? Depends. But are you feeling like there's a chance that this is the last time Maybe. you come to a place like yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Charged criminally and repeatedly for everything from tax fraud to cyber libel under laws condemned by human rights organizations globally. Are we a democracy or not? She knows jail might happen soon and maybe forever. She could move countries, avoid imprisonment, but as her book suggests, she won't. She still believes it is possible to stand up to a dictator. How you do that is why she came to talk. It's Isn't such an too? honor. Stopped en route by some Filipino-Canadian journalists eager to say hello. They know she matters and they know she's up against it. It's, it's extreme, extreme highs and then you drop. Oh my God, I'm going to jail, <laughs> extreme lows. Oh my God, will, I, will there be violence? It seems like all your avenues for appealing this conviction and the, are, are, are kind of done. You have one shot left, right? This Kafkaesque case, which is like a, a story that I didn't write, edit, or supervise, that was published at a time when the law we supposedly violated didn't even exist. I mean, I had 10 arrest warrants in less than two years. You know, there was like a period of time where every month I keep thinking, am I gonna get arrested again? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, this is political harassment, right? When they hear your case, how long will it take uh, before they render a decision? They could do it right away. It could be done quickly, it could, be, it could take years. What are you facing sentence-wise? For cyber libel, this particular one that is almost seven years in prison, I face a total of seven criminal charges right now, and the other cases, um, you know, total, it's almost 100 years. It's the rest o of my life. Almost 100 years. If I talk to my mom, I talk to people in the newsroom, they all say, Maria has an American passport. Why, why is she going back? Do you know what that means? That means I become a criminal. Is there not a part of you that says, I have to save my life. But who would I be if I didn't do the thing that I need to do? But I also feel like I know you enough now that you wear your work like a coat of armor. It really is. You go back to the States into the embrace of your family there and the people who love you would be enormously relieved and you could talk to newsrooms and young journalists all over the world and fire them up. I live in the Philippines, and in the Philippines, journalists are fighting for press freedom. And I do not want to be the tipping point to push the death of press freedom. I don't want to be a rat deserting a sinking ship, because hmm. I'm not convinced this, the ship will sink. Supporters of the slain broadcaster. Among the I've seen pictures of you at the wake of Percy Lapid. Uh, a journalist who was, who was gunned down in his car, right? He was waiting to enter his gated community, and a motorcycle um, shot him and killed him. Um, so that's what you him. talk about when you talk about violence against yes. you? It's, uh, it's the way assassinations are done. Of course I have security now. I've had to. Um, the reason I travel sometimes is it's so nice to walk around without mm -hmm. security, right? Without a flak jacket? Yeah, you've, you've come to Manila and you've seen, you've seen what we have to do. You have really good lawyers. And I know Amal Clooney is, is a global superstar. Is that helpful? Or in a strange way, is there the potential for that to be a hindrance? It's, I always call it my insurance card. Journalists have, we shine the light. That's our only defense, right? But I have a flashlight. Amal Clooney has Klieg lights, you know? An observation about you is that the closer this date gets, my outsider perspective is that there is a, a frantic nature to the work you're doing. Yeah. 
that you are talking to so many people, so many companies, so many political leaders. You are going, 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 going. What is the urgency of what it is you're trying to say to them? Oh my gosh. We're in the last two minutes of democracy, globally, right? I think there's far more at stake in the world than my freedom or my fate. Is this the tipping point for democracy or the other way, the tipping point for fascism? Mm -hmm. And you can see it, the rise of the right globally, right? I mean, you just saw Sweden, Italy, right? I mean, countries that you would not expect, the rise of Nazism in Germany. More autocracies than democracies. No. There are now more people around the world who live under autocratic governments than in democracies. The number of democracies have been rolled back to where it was 15 years ago. And when I say last two minutes, I mean two years. Two years. W what's the two years? Okay, so this year, right, there are 32 elections, key elections globally, French elections. Next year, you're going to have Turkey, Nigeria, African nations, the beginning of the Indian elections. 2024 is critical. The greatest problem we face today is how our minds are being manipulated through our emotions using fear, anger, and hate. Online, if someone is reading something and it fires them up and makes them furious, it will spread. But if it also fires them up and inspires, inspires them. them to act in a good way, that has the same it spreadability. Spreads. And look at where it happened globally, February 2022, this year, right? Uh, a comedy actor, oh, he happens to be president, decides not to leave his country mm -hmm. and stay, even though he could get killed. Premier Minister Shmagal Tut. And he inspires his entire nation to fight against overwhelming forces. If we don't change anything significantly now, if the tech doesn't change, if the corruption in our information ecosystem, what I call the atom bomb, if that continues, we will elect more illiberal leaders democratically who will then crumble the institutions of democracy from within. So what are my tools to do something about so it? So what's the solution, right? There is a solution. We've been through this before. Um, the long term, of course, is education. Mm -hmm. The medium term is legislation, which is why I've been speaking to so many governments. Um, the Digital Services Act in the EU, but the short term, what does civic engagement look like in the age of exponential lies? Not enough of us have figured this out. I'm not gonna be a tipping point right. to lose press freedom. You know what'll happen if I did do something like that? Every single journalist, they will move out of journalism. Every smart kid trying to be a journalist, that was what will break my heart. And, and you probably couldn't live with that, right? Oh my God, that would break my heart. Look, that's... That's what's making you upset, is the idea that that much is riding on Doesn't that on you. suck? <laughs> yeah, no it does, because that means that you, you're not actually free to make a choice that is a choice yeah. for you to make about yeah. your own life. It's not mine right now, right? It's not yours. It might be a while before we You come sit visit down. if I, something bad happens. Am I? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing so much. Thank you for having me here and reminding me newsrooms exist. Once again, it is important to note that interview happened before a Filipino court ordered her to refrain from talking about her case. Up next on The National, when the Me Too movement exploded on the scene five years ago, it changed the way the world thought about sexual assault. Up there, violence, no more silence. How the movement has changed, the strides it's made, and where it might go from here. The conversations around sexual assault and sexual harassment are vastly different right now from what they were just five years ago. So that is when the Me Too movement kicked off and took off. It started in Hollywood, but it's torn through industry after industry, and it's still on the move. Lisa Shing takes a look at some of the big names that fell as the culture of silence did too. Thousands of women around the world spoke out against sexual harassment using just two words, Me Too. Now there are millions of Me Too's out there on social media. You must be worried about 
In the wake of explosive allegations against film producer Harvey Weinstein, actor Alyssa Milano posted a message on Twitter. Using the term coined by activist Tarana Burke a decade earlier, Milano urged women who had experienced sexual assault or harassment to tweet, Me too. What followed is widely considered to be a watershed moment. We saw people in different countries taking to the streets. The accusations against powerful men first emerged in Hollywood. Weinstein, Kevin Spacey and Bill Cosby were taken to court. Weinstein was sentenced to 23 years in prison and is currently facing another trial. And allegations quickly surfaced in other industries, politics, food, theater and journalism. Prominent anchors like Matt Lauer and Charlie Rose were fired. In music, R. Kelly was sentenced to 30 years in prison on racketeering and sex trafficking charges. Canadian singer Jacob Hogard is facing five years after he was found guilty of sexual assault causing bodily harm. In the sports world, perhaps the most stunning example. I want the nightmares of you coming into my room to go away. More than 150 women accused Larry Nasser, a former doctor for USA Gymnastics, of sexual abuse. In Canada, sponsors withdrew their support. We liquidated a portion of our investments to pay. And Hockey Canada's entire board of directors resigned over allegations of sexual assault by players and mismanagement of settlements to victims. As industries reckon with bad behavior, Me Too has become a movement that continues to evolve. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. So how has the Me Too movement evolved and expanded? What could its future hold? With me is Farah Khan, an advocate and educator on sexual violence. So Farah, we know this conversation has been happening for a lot longer than five years. But when you look at the momentum of the Me Too movement, what has come of that? Well, I think that people have realized that it's not a moment, it's a movement. And that survivors, advocates, researchers, educators, students have been asking for this for a long time. And so we're seeing a watershed time where people not only start talking about it then, but continue to talk about it. From Hockey Canada, to athletics, to schools, to parents, people are talking about this and saying we need to take action. And it means, I suppose, that, that more women are feeling comfortable coming forward, but there's an asterisk there yes. because it's... It, it, it must be the case that, that there's not an equal level of comfort. No, there isn't. So communities that have been policed, have been criminalized, black communities, indigenous communities, racialized communities may feel and do feel that they can't go forward to the police because there's a not a trust there. Also, young people, when they go forward, feeling that no one's really going to believe them. We also see women in the workplace, when they do report, what research has come out of Time's Out has found that 7 out of 10 women, when they do come forward, face reprisal. So why would I go forward if I'm going to be harmed again? Which is what they said for a long time. Yeah, and it continues to happen. One of the conversations uh, from the Me Too movement that I think has, has become interesting for people is these non-disclosure agreements mm -hmm. that, that women suggest they were bullied into signing. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it kept them quiet, but, but it kept them from warning other women. It kept them from, from talking about their own story. There's been a big push to try to ban them in some places, but what, what's happened with that? Well, there are actually good things that have happened with it. So PEI is the first province or territory to put forward and pass legislation around NDAs. Mm -hmm. And so that's really important. And, and Manitoba is going forward as well. So we need every province and territory to look at NDAs and look at how they're actually very harmful. We saw that in the Hockey Canada conversation. We see that with Harvey Weinstein victims. We see that again and again and again. One of the things that I think people need to realize too is that NDAs are not protecting anyone, especially other survivors or people that might be potentially harmed. So they need to go. Okay, lots more work to go. Farah Khan, thank you. Thank you. Now, as we've mentioned, this movement really began with allegations of sexual assault being made against Harvey Weinstein. He is now serving a 23-year sentence. But in L.A. right now, he's also standing trial again, charged with 11 counts of rape and sexual assault involving five women. He's pleaded not guilty. We have more ahead on the national, including efforts to protect a species under threat. As the bats go down, insects are going to go up, pesticides are going to go up, crops are going to be devastated. Coming up, why some say these winged creatures are far less spooky than you think. Plus, 
After 54 days alone in the wilderness, the cat came back in our moment. Bats, of course, get a bad rap, especially on this night on Halloween, but several BC cities are making efforts to protect them and to educate people about the good they do. Tonight, Susanna Da Silva shows us why they need help more than ever before as a menace approaches. Well, hopefully we're going to see a little bit of guano. Uh, Danielle Dagenet works as a crusader, out. minus the cape, to break through the mystery and dispel the myths around bats. So it's a natural pest control. You know, as the bats go down, insects are going to go up, pesticides are going to go up, crops are going to be devastated. A bat can eat 1,000 insects an hour on summer nights, just one of many reasons her group is working with cities like Richmond to protect them, one of a handful in B.C. designated as bat-friendly. It's set up a bat condo, a place for female bats to raise the one pup they have each year in the summer. Dagenet is checking to see if anyone has visited. It's a slow process, uh, but the objective is to get them in, and the more we get them in here and get them in a regular roost, then we can attract them to other parts of the city. A stronger population may also mean better resistance to an approaching threat. White nose syndrome, a fungus that disturbs the sleep of hibernating bats, causing starvation and death. It has nearly wiped out some populations in eastern Canada and it's making its way west. It's in neighboring Washington state and may already be here in BC. We have so much to learn and, and honestly quite a, a short period of time. BC has the widest variety of species in the country, but scientists say research on them is lacking because they are nocturnal and elusive, but also because of false myths around the amount of disease they spread, the potential for bites, and even fear about them perpetuated by Halloween. In the West, we don't even know where they hibernate, so there's no way we're going to ever get into places to show you piles of dead bats. And so they're just kind of disappearing into crevices and maybe just not coming back out. To help learn more, researchers are even dressing up poles as old growth trees using a fake bark to provide more habitat for bats being forced out by development and they double as places to study the world's only flying mammal. Almost half of the baby bats that are born die every year. Part of protecting them comes through education, like this impromptu lesson to a school passing by. Nobody seemed scared or hesitant, they all just seemed really interested. And it's those moments that it makes me feel like, you know, I'm doing a good job. Wider knowledge of bats, plus some signs this condo may have had some tenants. A good day, Dagenet says, helping one of nature's most underappreciated species. Susanna the Silva, CBC News, Richmond. So we've talked bats, let's talk black cats. It is Halloween, of course. This is Gustav. You know, of course, it's supposed to be bad luck crossing paths with a black cat, but finding Gustav didn't mean bad luck at all. It meant a family reunited. So Gustav scampered away from his owner while they were camping in Alberta, apparently as you do. 54 days later, complete strangers helped him find his family, and that compassion is our moment. It's just really nice to have our family back together and we're all just absolutely so happy about it. Well, we went camping in the Kananaskis Valley with, for my son's birthday and our cat really likes to be outside. We decided we'd take him camping with us, but then we woke up in the morning and he was not there anymore. I think we cried all the way to Calgary. <laughs> so I posted his picture in there and kind of said, if you see this cat, he's mine. Here's my phone number. I never met her. I don't, you know, I think I just felt for, you know, she's a thousand kilometers or more away. And I thought if I were her, I would love to have someone help me try and find this cat. So that's what I did. And I said, why don't I put a camera up for you where you lost him and let's see if he's still there. Lisa phoned me and she was like, oh my God, he's on the camera. He's on the camera. He's there. Well, he survived 54 days in the wilderness. We were jumped for joy and started crying with excitement. It was just a really spectacular moment. We couldn't even believe it, to be honest. Okay, so firstly, I love the non-ironic way she was wearing that witch's hat and just sort of offering the interview to our producer, uh, Andrew. Uh, Gustav is a good hunter. Maybe that's how he survived those 54 days. That is a national for October 31st. Happy Halloween. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.